Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining tonight. This is your host Nino, inviting you to an episode on a beauty of ancient times, which this October really turns 60. And what I am talking about is, of course, the Olivetti Programma 101, presented in October 1965 at the New York 1964 World Fair and having been designed by a team of just four to five people around Pier Giorgio Perotto. It is Italy's pride in many ways, as it is counted by many and certainly also by me as being the first personal computer. At the time of its introduction, it cost around $3,200, which is pretty exactly nowadays 10 times the amount in nowadays money. But still, if that looks a lot, it was still just a sixth of what a PDP-8 mini computer would cost, having been introduced in March of the same year, that is 1965. It was slightly larger than a typewriter and weighed just above 35 kilograms. It needed 30, 350 watt power. In other words, it did not need any specialized room, any strong currents, nothing like that. It needed no floor cabling and whatnot. It was in fact comparatively portable. And if you think about it, it was even possible for an, an enthusiast to own it. Rather enthusiastic, it seems, NASA has been, for they bought at least 10 machines and have been famously using them for computations for the Apollo moon landing in 1969. Now the world was quite different then. You have to imagine that the Gulf of Tonkin incident was just a year ago and owning a computer was considered a sort of absurd endeavor, only confined to those who need it or those insanely rich to entertain themselves with such a machine. It would be pretty much as if you were owning your own private airplane nowadays or your own helicopter or something along these measures. But the Perotina made it possible to actually have a computer. And it was not oriented towards computer scientists. It was much unlike other candidates of the first personal computer in that it did not give you input and output in terms of binary lights, but indeed it just worked with normal floating point numbers that were printed and input in a rather intuitive fashion. So this little beauty here I discovered was apparently used by the US military at least into the 1970s, as I found here on the dtick.mil site a report on the comparative analysis of human reliability models from 1971. You can look it up and it does mention that programs for some of the things they are trying to do do exist for the Olivetti 101 Perotina. Impressive one might think, and there exists a whole plethora of information on the machine, the trouble being most of it is in Italian. Yeah, there exist also a bunch of emulators, also mostly by Italians. And I was thinking, People, your machine is so amazing. I really want to have a look at it. I really want to try it out myself. But again, it was apparently, at least judging by the name, an Italian who was ready to help. For if I go to the Google Play Store, then here, clicking on search, if we look for EMU 101, and scroll past the ridiculous game whatever emulators, we are finding here... Hey, where are you? 
Ja, the M101 by Bioprocessore. And that, when you open it, gives you a really beautiful interface of the Perotina. I mean, to design such a machine, what Pier Giorgio Perotto did with a team of four to five people at these times, something unheard of, it just will not stop to impress me. I really have to say that. So that is your interface. And here on the upper left corner is basically our paper stream or paper tape on which we are printing things. Now, there are a lot of puzzling controls somewhat, but actually the machine can be used even without programming. Now, that's obviously not what you came here for and we will program it, but I just want to show you if you get the emulator from the Google Play Store, you can actually immediately start using it. For instance, in order to compute two thirds, you are saying two, you're pressing two, and then whatever you're pressing, it's not visible, right? Then you're pressing this on the right hand, this A with the down arrow symbol. That means get that into the accumulator. Yeah, two, yeah, now we got it. So now the accumulator is containing a two. If I now press three and then press the divide sign, then it will divide two by three and give me a result of 0.6666. You can change the precision here on the right side. You see this little dark square here where it's written four. There you can demand more precision up to 15 positions are available. And if you want to do a completely new calculation, you could press this little elongated button here on the left. So that's the clear button. And we can, I don't know, compute, for instance, one seventh. Let's say it this way. Okay, so one into A, seven divide, and there you go. And that way you could use it if you want to in the style of a desktop calculator. It is, of course, a fun way, you know, if you pick up your phone in order to quickly use the calculator, and then what you're using is a simulated perotina. Nifty, right? Very well, but that is not all it can do. In reality, it had also magnetic stripes and you could record up to 120 instructions on one side of the stripe. You could turn it around for 250 altogether. And the stripes were just a storage medium, whereas everything was happening in memory. So if you put in a magnetic stripe, it would save things on it or read later things from it into memory and then execute from memory. Well, how then do we program it, right? That's of course the interesting part. And here you have to get the manual. I cannot really describe all the details, but what you're seeing here in darker color, these, these bluish things with the white lettering on them, these are the registers. So you're here having some A register, an R register, you're having B, C, D, E, F, and then there is this M register, which you're seeing on the left upper hand side. This is simply containing whatever keyboard input you're having. Most functions are performed between M and A, just like our division operation. So the accumulator is getting something and putting the results inside itself after computation. Whereas M is what, what the user just typed in. There are two clear keys, which is somewhat puzzling perhaps. One is this asterisk down here, which is just to clear the last number. Whereas this bigger clear key here on the left is clearing the last instruction or fragment of an instruction. So that is sort of your error correction key during programming. This big white button on the left in the middle, that's general reset and up here on the upper hand right corner, the red spot is your error light. Let me demonstrate the error light. 
So I'm having one and that goes into the accumulator and I am typing zero and I'm dividing by zero. And now you see the error flashed up. No, man, you can't divide by zero. You press the general reset button here on the left and that way you get rid of the error. Now programming really happens as a sort of reflection of the manual usage. Basically what you would be doing manually that the machine could simply record and then execute for you. The trick is that it also could permit if needed conditional jumps and that makes the thing so to say Turing complete well of course within its very narrow limitations. Now the jumps here are an adventure of themselves because they are happening this way that you're always having a from address and a to address. <laughs> this is just a pair of things and in the simplest version for instance AV stands for jump to here from the marker V. So if you have somewhere in your programming code a V and somewhere else a marker AV then the moment the machine reaches V it will jump towards AV. You understand? So you're not saying go to something but you're putting a from marker and wherever you want to go in your code there should be a to marker. Well with that we actually got the basics sort of covered. There is this little split key here on the lower left hand side that further allowed you to split registers if you needed more space for numbers but less precision. So that was the trade-off it was introducing. We will not need that for our little experiment. And then there is of course this little, um, how do you call this, the print button here, this thing. This is just printing whatever is in the accumulator. So if I put 9 into the accumulator and I say print then yeah it prints 9. If I put 0 into the accumulator and say print then it prints 0. With that you fundamentally know how this is more or less working and down there this V, W, Y and Z these are the four routines that you could be having in your program and that you could be triggering by pressing these keys respectively. Because you know 120 instructions that's actually quite a lot and maybe you want to have more than one routine per card. Anyway let's then go ahead. I have just devised a very simple program to compute the hypotenuses in a triangle. So you give the two cathets and then it is computing the hypotenuses. Okay so first we are pressing the regpr thing here on the upper right side that means a register program. Okay we're now ready whatever we're now doing the machine will record and as it is recording it it will print step by step what we are doing. First we need to insert a return jump so to say that is in order to have our program repeat and repeat and repeat we need to say where from this loop is all the time beginning. We are saying that by inputting a v so that is a jump address so jump to here from somewhere and this from somewhere will be the final instruction in our program. Then we are saying stop the computer. It's counterintuitive perhaps but that means we now want to input a number. Having input that number we would like to put it into the accumulator. So we're putting the number into the accumulator. Then the next instruction is a multiplication instruction and because we do not say anything to multiply with, we just say multiply, it will understand to multiply the accumulator by itself. Okay, by now we would be having the first number squared in the accumulator. So there's, you know, the formula is the square root of the sum of the squares of the two triangle sides. So a to the square we have, now we need to add it to b to the square. 
So temporarily we have to deal now with B, we have to input B, but we don't want to lose our result in A, so we need to put it into the F register. And that happens via the F exchange key. That means exchange the register F with the register in A. So F is where we want to temporarily store our number. And exchanging with the accumulator means that the accumulator result is now stored in the register F. Now we say again stop, which is actually a stop and go instruction. It is stopping the machine, allowing your keyboard input, and then you're pressing it again, and then it just simply continues. So that is in order to input our second operand. Again, now it is in the accumulator, like lovely. And, I uh, know it's not yet, we have just stopped the machine, but we need to input it into the accumulator. Good. So now we multiply it by itself. So accumulator times accumulator, but this time for the second number. And now we want to add that square to the number we stored in the F register. Now we need, therefore, to say not just the operand itself, but with what? And that would be F plus. So add F to the accumulator and store to the accumulator. Now we have the sum of the squares. The only thing we now need to do is to take the square root of the accumulator, and you might do, for instance, a square root. And finally, it would be really nice to see our result, which is a print, print the accumulator. And now, as a final instruction, we say a single V, which means jump towards the jump target, which is the first instruction of the program. In other words, repeat for as many triangles whose hypotenuses I want to compute. Being thereby done, I type again reg pr, so we turn that off, and if I now press v down there, the machine will be ready to accept two numbers from me and compute their hypotenuses. So v, cute, and let's say now 8 s and 6 s. It blinks, computes, and we get the correct result of 10. Yeah, these are these magic numbers, and we can, you know, we can take also some weirdo number, I don't know, some triangle with 3.9815 s and 67.5 14 S. And yeah, my gosh, that was a very squashed triangle. Therefore, the hypotenuse is just slightly larger than this very long cathet. And so on and so forth until I am done with my computation. And then I press the big white button here on the left, which is clearing my program and now I am ready to do whatever else I want to do with the machine and program it with something different. Well, I think you get the gist of it. It is a little bit confusing if you have never seen it done before. If you speak Italian, I clearly can tell you there are better videos on that topic than mine. But for a first introduction, into the programming of the Perotina. I hope this video will serve well enough. And that's really it for tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for having been my guest and I hope to greet you here soon again. If not a subscriber yet, please consider joining our curious and friendly club. Until we meet again, I wish you a wonderful time. Thank you for watching. And from me, goodbye.